Hey everybody, Noah here from Learn Meta Analysis, and in this video we're going to go over what I like to call a scoping document. And this is essentially what I use to record all the details of my systematic review or meta-analysis. Uh, as I am conducting it. So you can also think of this as like a planning document or simply for record keeping. So I've created this template here, which you are welcome to copy to your own Google Drive or simply download it and use it with your own projects. Um, but this goes through a lot of things that I like to record as I go throughout the systematic review or meta-analysis process. And it, I'm not gonna claim it's all encompassing or anything like that. So if you're worried about there not being specific information that you might need, for example, if you use automated screening tools, I don't have details on this form about the things that you need to record for that because I don't typically use them. But if you are using something like that to automatically exclude studies, there's additional things that you should report when you actually write up your review. So when in doubt, refer to the Prisma statement. So let's go through quickly here what I think you should record along the way at what I would consider to be the bare minimum to have a reasonably well-reported systematic review. So the first thing that we have here is our project title. You can call that whatever you want, obviously. Uh, the second section is for research questions, and we will come back to why I like to list the research questions on this document later, but it has to do specifically with the uh, data extraction phase. All right, so this gets us down to probably the most important and one of the most challenging things to keep straight, which is our literature search. So something that's very easily overlooked and it doesn't get reported in all meta-analyses and systematic reviews that I've read, but I really wish it would, would be the date of the literature search. Please write down the exact day or days that you actually search the literature and the more specific you can be, the better. Uh, what I like to do, to be honest with you, is to actually do my entire literature search in one day. So I'll just take an afternoon Afternoon and search all the databases that I know I need to search so that way I can say on this one specific day I searched all these databases for these keywords and I found this many studies so I always have a spot where I can write that down right at the beginning moving down into my database and search strategy table this is probably the most important table that you're gonna have for record-keeping purposes I know for me this is the one that I really value the most so let me show you an example of how I keep track of things here so the first thing I would record is my database name so I'm gonna pretend I searched academic search complete and I don't like these to be in bold that's just personal preference but um, academic search complete and the second thing I do is I insert my exact search string. So I'm gonna make up a search string right now, but it'll be something like this for our virtual agent study. Um, virtual human, and we'll say learn and we'll just pretend like that's it. Okay, and that's how I record the information about my database and my search string for every single one. So the additional thing that I'll mention is if there's any additional filters, I would mention them here. So let's say, for example, that you searched ACM. Sorry, the bold gets to me. Uh, there we go. So let's say you searched ACM, and I'm actually just gonna copy paste this so that I don't have to retype that again and you use the same search string. But maybe within ACM, you weren't able to actually search in the same way that you were able to search one of the other databases. For the sake of conversation here, we'll say academic search complete. Like, for example, let's say with ACM, you had to restrict your search to abstracts only. Then I would record that here. So the reason we record this here is this is so that a reviewer knows how you search different databases. So they'll be able to see in this example that when you searched Academic Search Complete, you didn't have any additional filters. But when you searched ACM, you did. And so another thing that I commonly see, I personally mostly disagree with it in many cases, but sometimes you'll see systematic reviews or meta-analyses that say they search peer-reviewed journal articles only. That is another thing that I would add in to this table if you are doing that. Again, it's a whole different conversation of why I don't like that. My personal belief is that we are, with systematic reviews and meta-analyses, we are generally trying to create the most comprehensive literature search that we can, and only searching peer-reviewed journal articles, to me, is not comprehensive. In addition, uh, you'll often hear people, or you'll see the argument that we searched peer-reviewed journal articles to help ensure study quality. Well, in my opinion, that's not a valid argument. I have read so many absolutely terrible journal articles that were peer-reviewed that I don't consider that to be a quality metric in any way, shape, or form. So. Personally speaking, I tend to search all the literature. Um, I, I, include I include dissertations, I include theses, I include conference proceedings, book chapters, anything that may meet my inclusion criteria. But that is a choice that you can make on your own about your study. 
The second piece that I want to draw your attention to is this references from section. And so this is where if you are including references of previous reviews in the area, which I generally recommend that you should do, this is where you can write that down and how many studies were found. So for example, if you searched, sorry about the bold, it drives me crazy. Um, let's say you searched my meta-analysis from 2013. I have no idea how many references were in there, but we'll just put number over here on the right side. and. For these, we will also put number up here because however many there were, we would want to report that. So uh, let's say, completely hypothetical example, but let's say you found 172, you'd want to have 172 here. You'd, let's say there were 133 in this database, you'd want to report that here. Okay, so after you have all of your databases, and you can add as many lines to this as you need to, uh, I typically search somewhere between six and eight databases for uh, studies in my field, but your field may vary. Um, a number of reviews, you can of course add extra uh, lines here as well if you have additional reviews that you need to cite. So here, the total number of research items, all this is is I just sum all of the numbers I have here to find out how many items I have total before removing duplicates. Then I use Zotero or Covidence or Rayan or whatever system that you want to use to remove your duplicates. I use that and then I record how many duplicates were removed. After that, I end up with my total number of unique items for phase one screening. And I call phase one screening the title and abstract screening. So this is where I record the total number here. So let's, uh, I don't know, we don't need an example, but I'm just gonna record number. Let's say hypothetically we had 100 research items and then we had eight duplicates and that leaves us with 92 unique items. Okay, then we're gonna go through titles and abstracts. We're gonna figure out how many of these do we think need to be retained for the next step. So let's say we only, let's say we removed, I don't know, 32. Um, so that leaves us with approximately 60, right? So now we have 60 items that we're trying to find for phase two screening, which would be the full text screening. So we're gonna try and not find all 60, but let's say there's a few that you can't find, right? So let's say that you couldn't find like five of them, then what we'll do is we'll record how many we ended up actually being able to screen, and you should make a note here of why you were not able to locate some of those studies. So you can, if that's the case, you can simply add a line to this and record that here. Uh, then as we're going through the phase two screening or the full text screening, we're going to have specific reasons why we are excluding studies and we want to record those reasons here and the number of studies that qualified under each one. And at the end, we're going to end up with our total number of studies that we actually analyzed. So what this will do is this will set you up so that you can actually create your Prisma diagram. So you can create your Prisma diagram using the uh, Shiny application. So I'll show you that real quickly just because it's super cool and helpful. We'll go ahead and we'll start out on the Create Flow Diagram page. And you can see they have a number of options here on the left side that are gonna help you complete it. And it'll autofill over here on the right side. And then you can uh, just download this when you're done. So we'll have a separate video walking through how to actually create the Prisma Flow Diagram using that really nice flowchart maker that they've made into the Shiny app. There's also a link here to the Prisma checklist and this will directly download the uh, Word file onto your computer. So the next thing that we need to record here are our inclusion criteria. These are super important. These are what studies need to have to be included in your analysis. This is going to very highly depend on the type of review that you are conducting. Let's say I'm going to create a meta-analysis focused on the use of virtual characters compared to no virtual characters because I wanna know how effective virtual characters are for learning compared to any other condition that is not a virtual character. So one of the inclusion criteria that I would need here is it must compare a virtual character condition to a non-character condition. Okay, second, if this were a meta-analysis, I gotta have enough information to calculate an effect size. Okay, next, uh, unfortunately I only speak English, so I'm going to say one of my inclusion criteria is it must be published in English. And last but not least, for now, I'm gonna say it must be publicly available. 
So I've gotten the question before of what do I mean by publicly available? And what I mean by that is I need to be able to actually get the document. So there, you might run into things where something is published and you can find a citation for it online, but you can't actually get it. There's like no way to actually get it. You Maybe the publisher doesn't exist anymore. Maybe there's no copies online. Uh, maybe you've searched ResearchGate and Academia and all these other websites and you just can't find it. Uh, maybe you can't, you can't even get it through an interlibrary loan. So in that case, uh, I would say the study was not published available if that were to happen. So I always have that in there as a criteria. So now for exclusion criteria. This should specify things to help you exclude studies that would otherwise be included, but you don't want them to be included because it's not what you're interested in. So in this case, what can I think of? Well, sometimes you see actual humans on the screen and people refer to them as virtual characters. So we don't want that. We want to actually be only using computer generated characters for our analysis. So in this case, I'm going to say that studies were excluded if they used uh, an image of an actual human. The second thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to exclude studies if they are an avatar or a self-representation. And the reason is because a self-representation is different than learning from a virtual character on the screen. So here uh, I'm going to say used an avatar or other representation of self. Okay, so hopefully these examples give you some ideas of how inclusion and exclusion criteria can work, and they're going to 100% depend on the type of analysis that you're running and the research questions that you have asked. But hopefully these examples give you a general idea of what it is that we're going for. All right, so now we are down to the data extraction uh, phase of this document. So the first thing I've recorded here is inter-rater reliability and inter-rater agreement details. And the reason I included this is because people don't report this very frequently and it really needs to be reported. It absolutely has to be recorded. So here, the number of study, percent of studies that are dual coded, um, I'm gonna actually add a note to this template. Um, generally, we're looking for about 20%. So we'll say hypothetically here, we did screen 20 studies and I'll typically report the actual number that goes along with it. So I'll say N equals however many studies uh, there actually were. Uh, then we have our reliability or agreement statistics. So this might look like Cohen's kappa. It might be some sort of correlation. It might just be a percentage of agreement. It's gonna totally depend on what approach you take to calculating this. So this is up to you but I highly recommend that you write down what it is. So uh, we'll say, for example, uh, that we use Cohen's kappa and we found 0 0.90. All right, so then the next section is de description of the variables extracted. Now, what I like to do here personally is actually refer back to my research questions. So to do that, what I would do is I would actually add another layer to this and I'm actually gonna do this now. So research question one, and then I'm gonna indent these, and I am just going to copy paste this and make it part of the uh, template for you guys here because this is how I actually tend to record things um, on my own. So, okay, so what I would do here, sorry, I'm just building this out the rest of the way so you can see how this would work. Okay, so what I would do is I would have each research question actually stated here, and then I actually specify which variables I extracted or what data I extracted from primary studies to address each research question. Now, there's two reasons for this. First and foremost, it makes it really easy to see how your data actually tracks towards answering your research questions. And second, it makes sure that you actually have the data to answer your research questions. Because if you just come up with a list of random variables, it's very, very easy to accidentally miss things that would have addressed your research question. So I like to plan it out this way. So this way I can really easily see what variables I extracted and how they meet my research questions. So what I have here is for variable extracted, I'll give you an example of this. Um, let's say our research question is uh, about the virtual character's appearance. So uh, how does the appearance of the virtual character influence learning, right? My first variable that I extract might be the character's age. And here I would say something like coded as child, adult, non-human, or not reported. 
okay? And so here, this what would I be doing? When I'm actually extracting data in this case, I would be looking at that virtual character in the system, and I would be objectively saying, okay, I'm looking at this picture of this character, and it looks to me as though this character is supposed to be an adult. And then I look at the description that the authors provide, and if they don't specify, I go by off of my what I believe the picture is supposed to be. But oftentimes they will actually specify in their paper the age that the character is supposed to be. Some studies use characters that look like children. Some studies use characters that look like adults. Some studies use characters that look non-human. It might be like a drone or some other sort of robot or something like that. And then sometimes people just don't report it. And if that were the case, we can just say not reported. These things are going to end up being reported in your manuscript. So it's actually really important that you keep track of these and it's clearly explained here so that a reviewer is able to understand what you did. So the final thing that I keep track of on my scoping document is just a note section. And this is for general decisions that I made throughout the process. So what I'll typically do is I will typically record the date as well as whatever notes I have from screening that day or from coding that day. That way, you know, two months later when I come back to this, I don't have to guess and check of why I did something or why I didn't do something. So anytime I make a decision, even if it seems relatively minor, I always keep notes about it. And that does mean that this document ends up being pretty long. This document might be 10 or 20 or 30 pages by the time you're done. But the nice thing is if, if you're sitting there trying to figure out why you did something and you just can't remember, you can just search this document and hopefully you'll have some notes as to why you made that decision. So that pretty much wraps up the scoping document and planning process for your systematic review or meta-analysis. Uh, the next step of this is actually running the literature search. So with that said, I am going to stop talking here so I don't ramble on about this forever. Uh, thank you guys and I'll see you in the next video.